uh, and now Mohit is, I think he has some ish problem with the connection of um, video connection. No, no, yes. Is the it problem okay is, now? Yes, it is. Uh, the problem is with the video. Somehow it is asking for a Zoom update, but my audio is fine. So I do uh, have yeah, a... Okay, no problem. Yeah. All right. No problem. We 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 have sympathy, so we can imagine. Okay. Uh, even yeah. even without without seeing you. Okay. Mohit is uh, uh, active uh, PhD candidate. Uh, he is uh, pursuing his PhD uh, uh, PhD uh, program in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, uh, Indian in Indian at Indian Institute of Technology and in New Delhi, Delhi. Uh, and his research uh, in, includes uh, the modernist milieu as, of, 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 and aesthetics and the postmodern condition in general and continental philosophy largely, Marxist studies, political violence and the idea of justice. Uh, is also, Mohit is also working on Bexon. I mean, uh, part of his, this general research. And last year he gave also an interesting uh, talk as well uh, uh, of, on our conferences. And uh, mostly he's uh, interested in Bexon's influence on Eliot. And he wants to overcome the fundamental divide between Eliot the philosopher and Eliot the poet. Uh, this is uh, his uh, larger, uh, aim to, to, to focus on. Today he will uh, give a talk on sympathizing with the other, locating sympathy in the works of Bergson and Kitaro Nishida. Mohit. Yes, uh, thanks for that very nice introduction. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank uh, Yasushi, uh, other organizers, uh, Katerina, uh, Emily, and Mathilda, for organizing this research project on Bergson, uh, because I do believe along with everyone that it is absolutely necessary to uh, resurrect Bergson from the footnotes that uh, Heidegger had assigned him in the 1927 edition of uh, Being in Time. So I think it is very important for all of us to negotiate more things related to Bergson. Okay, so now I'm going to begin uh, my screen sharing. Okay, uh, yeah, this is the one. Okay, is, is it visible? Because there are a lot of things <laughs> happening in my laptop. Yes. Okay, okay, great. Okay, so, um, all right. So this is the topic that I'm going to talk about today, which is sympathizing with the other, and it draws a lot of connections with what Alexandra has just talked about, you know, locating sympathy in the works of Bergson and Nishida. And so now here I begin. The time of the philosopher is defined by the creation of concepts, which both Henry Bergson and Kitaro Nishida affirm in their works. Uh, the radicality of Bergson and Nishida's philosophy lie in their integrative power with which they bring interior and psychological, but also organic and cosmic states together. I aim to illustrate through this paper the affinities between Bergson and Nishida's philosophical thoughts through the notion of sympathy. I will show that Bergson's intuitive metaphysics and Nishida's philosophy of I and you are informed by a sympathetic relationship with the other and life as such. Just one second. Yeah. Uh, Bergson declared himself to be the philosopher of immediate data of consciousness and suggested a reality interior to consciousness, which according to Frederick Worms has necessarily been misinterpreted, and I quote, as a reality act subjectivity outside of consciousness in general, um, you know, such that uh, there would be nothing to consciousness but the name, a masking of a new kind of natural reality. In the same way, the freedom that it pretends to found would be nothing but the mask of a new kind of psychic determination, which, it, which its dynamism or vitalism does not make less restrictive. From Pulitzer to Neber to Molu Ponti and Sartre, how many lectures from 1930s onward were based on such a critique, unquote. According to Worms, the reality, which is the lift duration that Bergson advocates, arises within the consciousness through the experience or the sensible data prohibiting its existence independent from us. This reality then expands via intuition into a processual whole. Duration is a formal concept and shifts the focus to the ontological sp split between present and past, actual and virtual. Bergson's formal concept of duration arises within consciousness and as such takes into consideration both life and consciousness. 
Bergson's philosophy of time, which plays a pivotal role in his entire corpus, desists from grouping under a philosophical system because of its resistance to description based on natural and philosophical languages. The concept of pure duration has a strong psychological bearing and is not based on spatial determinations. Buxon states, and I quote, we can thus conceive of succession without distinction and think of it as a mutual penetration and interconnection and organization of elements, each one of which represents the whole and cannot be distinguished or isolated from it except by abstract thought, unquote. So time presents itself as a bundle of dimensions woven together. And the philosophy of time has to address all of them in one way or the other without collapsing the metaphysical, ontological, psychological frameworks on which it rests. The nature of Bergson's problems can be grasped by the interior state, which can retroactively remove the metaphors and extensiveness of space and eventually lead to a coherent unity, which affirms the process of becoming. In this regard, Molyu Ponti in Phenomenology of Perception presented a critique of the interior states, which potentially aims to remove the spatial religion, spatial regions. Molyu Ponti took an opposing stand from Deleuze's position, according to which the external difference exceeds to the internal difference uh, in the purely intuitive state. Deleuze's position uh, is based on the metaphor of melody that Bergson provided in duration and simultaneity. And I quote, a melody to which we listen with our eyes closed, heeding it alone, comes close to coinciding with this time, which is the very fluidity of our inner life. But it still has too many qualities, too much definition, and we must first efface the difference among the sounds, then do away with the distinctive feature of sound itself retaining of it only the continuation of what proceeds into what follows an uninterrupted uh, transition, multiplicity without divisibility and succession without separation in order to finally rediscover basic time. Such is immediately perceived duration with which we would have no idea of time." Unquote. Mm -hmm. Now, Molyu Ponti argues that the loss of difference which happens in the pure duration is not grounded in the phenomenal body. And as such, the vertical passage between duration and intuition undermines Bergson's philosophical method. This perspective is based on the premise that intuition apprehends duration. However, Bergson suggested that consciousness is expanded via the horizontal aspect of intuition. According to Bergson, intuition acts on discovering genuine differences and transforms the experience of knowing time. Bergson stated that the question is not whether past exists or not, which eventually leads to Malupondi's assertion about the irradiation of spatial regions, but whether past is available such that it can be acted upon. The past exists as a virtual in the present, and this difference in the nature of the past and present is grasped in the series of intuitive procedures. As a result of this recognition, the past does not pass out of existence, but remains conserved in a processual whole. From this discussion, I intend to state that in Bergson's philosophy, the planes of consciousness run parallel to and correspond to planes of reality, and this directs our attention to life itself. Bergson's suggestion then holds true that metaphysicians are much more closer to mathematicians than they would like to believe. We inhabit a world informed by Bergson's philosophy where the present is always in the process of becoming, unlike the world of a mathematician, which does not really endure. So can this kind of a vitalistic spirit that Bergson speaks of in his works function as a foundation for ethics, which can ground the phenomenal experience? Through Elan Vital, which has been claimed as another way of thinking about alterity, Bergson suggests a relation, a process, which is prior to and irreducible to that which we can know in intelligible ways and can speak intelligibly about. There is something that Bergson was really fascinated about, which escapes knowability and intelligibility. There is always something that remains to be thought because language, concepts, and categories by which we refer to experiences are not fully reducible to their reference, but they're equally not ontologically different in an absolute way. Now, my utterance in this conference is absolutely and irrefutably mine. However, my thought process cannot be reduced to my utterances about Bergson, although this is certain that the entire signifying process in which my utterances become meaningful does not take place apart from the material conditions that make it possible in the first place. What this proves is that as much as experience does not precede language and frames of 
intelligibility and is not knowable outside of categories and concepts by which we refer to these experiences. So concepts as frameworks that render experiences intelligible and knowable equally do not proceed or exist apart from these experiences and material reality. Strictly speaking, this means that the relation precedes that to which it relates. And so prior to sensing anything at all, I'm already in relation, not only to one particular other, but to many, to a field of alterity that is not restrictively human. In the absence of a formal concept of duration, which can ground us, one gets filled with the sense of uneasiness and uncertainty about our experience of being in this world without the essential conditions, which can ground the experience as the relata and the relations of that context are either no longer possible to identify or have become simply unknowable. Jean-Luc Nossi um, laments this particular and indiscernible quality in his book, The Creation of the World about the ways we address the world where the capacity of sense-making has already gone beyond the process of signification. He relies on Marx to secure the grounds for continued openness of the operative relation between the self and the other, which has been deformed and denied by necessarily unintelligible configurations of the glomus, this globe. However, for Bergson, beyond the idealism materialism debate lies creation. And creation itself presupposes something more fundamental, a revelation of human alterity, which simultaneously opens him to the charge of advocating impersonal pantheism. Bergson's version of ethics extends to the non-human forms of life, towards anything which genuinely endures, where the subject is understood as a potentiality, as a vibratory rhythm, and is structured by a more that opens it beyond itself and exposes the subject in its finitude to what exceeds it. It is because each subject has received a specific set of predicates and a unique set of possibilities that emerge in through and beyond these predicates that we can speak of a subject in terms of becoming, multiplicity, and potentiality. For both the predicates and the possibilities that are produced in and beyond predicates are not proper to the subject, but are markers of an impropriety and expropriation that lies at the very heart. The task of thought, and perhaps of philosophy too, is to make sense of this impropriety, which is perceived in terms of a threshold, something that Ellie During pointed out too in his comments uh, to Mark Rigo's presentation yesterday. However, for Bergson, it can be grasped if we cultivate intuition as a philosophical method, which can orient us to the durational concept of life or the character of life. Bergson's intuitive metaphysics, would not, and I quote, would not embrace in a single sweep the totality of things, For but for each thing, it would give an explanation which would fit it exactly and it alone. It would not begin by defining or describing the systematic unity of the world. Who knows if the world is actually one? Experience alone can say, and unity, if it exists, will appear at the end of this result or this search. It is impossible to posit at the start as a principle that this world is one. Furthermore, it will be rich, full unity, the unity of a continuity, the unity of our reality, and not the abstract and empty unity, which has become, which has come from one supreme generalization, and which would just as well be that of any possible world whatsoever. Unquote. Thus, it is through a sympathetic communication between forms of life, which is to be cultivated as a mode of intuition that can offer a radical transformation in understanding the relationship of the self with the world. This self-critical method, which can make existence encounter itself, acts upon the subject, surely through no will of his own, and transforms him into the kind of being with the capacity to sense something and to act. I quote, even as I come to speak within a philosophical discourse that firmly lodges the I at the source of this distinct action, I see that this I remains in thrall to a prior transitivity, acted upon as it acts. I cannot see this at all unless my ability to sense things has already been animated by a set of others and conditions that are emphatic, emphatically not mine. This is just another way of saying that no one transcends the matrix of relations that gives rise to the subject. No one acts without first being formed by a vital force as one with the capacity to act. Unquote. 
So Bergson employs the term sympathy as a methodological approach, which allows one to transport into the interior of an object in order to coincide with what there is unique and consequently inexpressive in it. For Bergson, sympathy invokes an intensification of being which emerges with the immersion in life. This sort of psychological endosmosis or interpenetration of minds is at once creative and reformative as far as understanding of life is concerned. Next slide. Nishida's philosophical project similarly hinges on the self's connection with the world. Nishida's response to reading books on was a major work entitled Intuition and Reflection in Self-Consciousness, in which he writes, and I quote, I was stirred by the works of Bergson, but again, despite my wholehearted agreements with him, my ideas do not wholly coincide with his, unquote. Nishida used this book, this book specifically, um, to answer the questions how conceptual experience arises from primary pure experience. Intuition for Nishida is a direct, non-reflective grasp of concrete reality, a consciousness of the unbroken progression of ultimate reality, intimately associated with the notion of pure experience. Nishida agrees with Bergson that the individual is an active self who participates in the immediate experience. However, their positions diverge when in intuition and reflection, Nishida views Bergson's concept of duration as a conceptualization that presupposes the existence of a timeless transcendent. The major point of difference between Nishida's way of looking at duration is that duration presupposes, a, um, you know, you can say a reference point uh, which through which one can suggest that the moment is not getting repeated. And there is the problem with Nishida because he's going to diverge and take a different route altogether, which is totally into Buddhist tradition, which is basically about absolute nothingness or the Japanese concept of Mu that I'm just going to talk about. So for Nishida, Bergson's emphasis on the primacy of temporal experience requires a constant point outside the flow of duration to assess the unrepeatable nature of duration. Thus, as opposed to Bergson's call to attune oneself with the vital and dynamic and pulsating character of life, Elan Vital, Nishida argues for the Japanese concept of Mu, an absolute nothingness, where through a dialectical movement, uh, which is very different from the pulsating movement that we see in Bergson's framework, the selfness is affirmed via negation. The question then becomes that what sort of a divergence emerges from Bergson and Nishida's perspective when both of them seemingly make a case for intuition? How are they so different? For Nishida, it follows that the active self lives as the other in active process of self-identity of absolute contradiction. It is in this way that Nishida describes the phenomenon of sympathy as becoming the other. In volume one of Nishida Tetsugaku Zenshu, which is a compilation of his works, Nishida writes, the love between a parent and child comes forth only when the parent becomes the child and the child becomes the parent, where they become one. Because the parent becomes the child, the parent feels each of the child's gains or losses as his or her own. And because the child becomes the parent, the child feels as his as his or her own each instance of joy or sadness which comes from the parent." Unquote. Chong Ching Yon, in his paper, The Essence of Sympathy in Nishida's Philosophy, which is also part of my uh, presentation, argues that here the love between mother and child can be understood as a sympathetical feeling. However, according to Chong, the problem of sympathy did not become a major topic in Nishida's works earlier on. It seems that Nishida initially sees love as an impulsive act. And I quote, when a person tries to help a child who falls into a pond, she or he does not think about whether the child is cute or not, unquote. This strong feeling of helping a child, however, is not the real meaning of love. Rather, according to Chong, it is just an example of the feeling of commiseration act in classical Confucianism. In an article titled Effective Feeling, Nishida writes, and I quote, we have to feel with the thing in order to know truly the thing. We have to sympathize with the person in order to know truly the person. To know a color is to feel with the color. To know a sound is to feel with the sound. An artist perceives color as a continuum of various dimensions which he sympathizes and acts together. When a person sees a high wire acrobat, he is acting with the acrobat. 
we have to combine first with the act in order to know the things and the combination with act is feeling unquote however it is crucial to point out that to sympathize is not simply to know someone Nishida is wrong to think that act of knowledge about a thing is the same as the act of sympathy between people. Nishida's philosophy of other can be understood only in a phenomenological sense by an act of sympathy. I can recognize by seeing you inside me, while you can recognize me by seeing me inside you. The phenomenon of sympathy is evident in the persons in love, but not in a person who is trying to know someone else. So one may ask, is there an epistemological grounding in Nishida's philosophy and Bergson's philosophical framework to situate the notion of sympathy? An epistemy which can perhaps guide us in a case of dilemma to be sympathetic towards other, which is basically the times in which we live, the times of fake news. Can we be really sympathetic to others in these times? The answer somehow emanates from Nishida's core concept, uh, Sui Kaikin, uh, just uh, excuse my Japanese pronunciation of pure experience, which approximates Bergson's pure perception or direct experience, although it is not completely identical because of Nishida's immersion in a Buddhist tradition. According to Mahayana tradition, the intuitive knowledge repudiates any association with the conventional knowledge systems and language. For Arit, example, you have the... only five minutes more. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll be able to wrap up in five minutes. Sure. Uh, so, um, as per the Buddhist tradition, the claim to know nothing is tantamount to the dissolution of horizons and relinquishment of those features of experience which assert an identity and difference. In Buddhist terms, this is referred to as realizing emptiness, which is something that absolute nothingness also points towards. Uh, then, just uh, give me one second. This can be skipped. Yeah, so there, there was one big part about uh, two sources of morality and religion that just like Alexandro talked about, but because of time limitations, I'm just going to skip that part. And uh, maybe I can just show you, this was the part that I wanted to discuss, but I think I don't have much time, which is basically about the moral distress. So I'm just going to begin from here and then I will be able to finish in four or five minutes. So Bergson's moral distress, which is there in two sources of morality and religion, uh, results from the obligation that the individual feels towards society to reattach himself. And in doing so gets enmeshed into the moral imperative based on societal conventions. The static religion that Bergson describes in the second chapter of Two Sources of Morality and Religion confines human freedom and eclipses the means for authentic self, which ultimately also restricts the potential to sympathize with the other. For Bergson, it is the open morality which orients us toward the movement of life in a vitalistic sense. That thus we see that according to Bergson, the focus is more on recognizing the durational reality and one's place in it rather than simply perceiving, which often gets distorted by the intelligible ways of making sense of this world. Nishida equally was at pains to elaborate that it is difficult to hold the theory of analogy in which the expression of you is known by the analogy of my expression. For Nishida, the other is not grasped from the outside of the person, but is simply the ground or place that is inside the personal self. The fundamental ground in Nishida's philosophy, namely place or basho, that is the concept that he talks about, is not a sphere with I alone, but a sphere with both I and you, uh, which have not been individuated. If Nishida speaks of love as an emotion, an emotion of the fusion of self and the other, or the union of subject and object, then for Bergson, love is the recognition of the imminent and vital forces of life, which affirm entanglements between the human and the non-human world. Nishita's active self is dialectical, for it lives as the other in the active process of self-identity of contradiction. Bergson's active self is pulsating with a generative force, which requires a constant re-evaluation of our understanding. As Elizabeth Gross argues, there is a need to remain flexible as opposed to the ossified ways of looking at time and consciousness to fully comprehend the differences which arise from the constant becoming and unbecoming of objects in the Bergsonian sense. And now I conclude by, um, sorry, 
uh, by undertaking this comparative exploration of books on and Nishida's perspectives, my goal has been to understand the notion of intuition or intuitive method through which one can recognize a sympathetic relationship with the others. And over here with others extends to the non-human realm as well. My concern then aligns with Ellie During's position in his 2016 essay, Coexistence and Flow of Time, where he argued, and I quote, the underlying problem as it turns out, is at once epistemological and metaphysical, or more precisely cosmological, because it relates to the way we can bind together the local flows attached to particular processes into a single whole, namely the particular object we refer to as the universe, a universe that itself endures, as Bergson reminds us, in creative evolution. And good. And thank you. Thank you, Mohit, for this stimulating uh, talk on and connecting sympathy to many other concepts, Bergsonian concepts and Nishidian concepts. Uh, now it is time for Thank discussion. You. Let me uh, start uh, with a question to uh, to Alessandro, and then we will open and then uh, to, to to Mohit, and then the floor will be open to other questions and comments and discussion. Uh, uh, Alessandra, thank you for uh, giving this, uh, I mean, interesting relation between uh, mysticism and energetism. I, uh, I saw that you uh, emphasized the distinction between the two uh, several times. Uh, and uh, I mean, probably um, they, both of them, both of the terms, they have similar or uh, joint uh, kind of interest in other, uh, in other uh, aspects of, of philosophy. Uh, I wonder, I mean, since, since energetism is more philosophical and mysticism more spiritual and, and religious, if it could be examined under like, instead of mysticism, energetism and Bergsonian vitalism, would it, they, it be more kind of uh, interconnected and what do you think about, I mean, avoiding the other problems that you highlighted during your talk, that uh, questions, uh, that um, challenges that come uh, out of this mysticism, energetism relation? Uh, should I answer now? Oh, okay. Um, Yes, in a way, we can start also from Bergson vitalism, but uh, the mystic experience is, a, is an experience of uh, contact with vital impulse. So in a way, um, it's just a matter of uh, which words uh, we, we choose to describe this kind of experience. My, my point, I, I would like to, uh, to insist on the a uh, specific link which is uh, we, uh, the, um, the, there is between mysticism and uh, uh, energies, just because I, 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 I want to, um, to underline the fact that for Bergson, mysticism is not immediately a religious phenomenon, but a, tra a transformative uh, puissance <laughs> or power, and it, it, it is um, a generalized mysticism. When I say that uh, Bergsonian mysticism is a generalized mysticism, and so it, it could be compared with energetism, is is because uh, what I think is that for Bergson, everybody, everyone can have a contact with the vital impulse. So in a way to say mysticism or vitalism, I think um, we say the same thing uh, with these two terms. Uh, of course, uh, religious um, mystics, uh, religious heroes are very rare and exceptional. So <laughs> we, we have to pay attention to the fact that nobody can every, every time, uh, everywhere. It, it, Mysticism requests uh, an effort, and this is, but also intuition, also metaphysics. Uh, so, um, uh, I, by this comparison, uh, compar um, uh, by this um, uh, comparison, what I would like to to underline is the fact that mysticism is a generalized mysticism for Bergson, like. Uh, <laughs> um, um, uh, um, 
and not only religious, and so it, it could be an ethic, Bergsonian ethic, I mean, something like that. And uh, um, I don't know if, if I have answered enough. That's fine, yeah, that's fine. I mean, okay. you also discussed the issue of freedom in both mysticism and energetism, but uh, you know, I mean, in mysticism, there is also a strong sense of obedience, obedience to God, obedience to the masters. So. Uh, uh, freedom uh, can be interpreted differently in mysticism, whether uh, in Nishidan energetism, probably freedom is much more stronger. I don't know what. what I don't know, because uh, mm, there, there are a lot of equivalents, uh, I mean, uh, which, which I try to, stre to stress, because uh, um, also for uh, if, if Wembergson Wenberg, says that we are passive towards God and active towards uh, other people. Uh, this uh, passivity or recept receptivity is the same intuition asked to us or freedom asked to us because we, we are not master uh, uh, of ourselves. I mean, there is a, a common ground uh, and a, 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 an equivalence uh, uh, could be made between, and Bergson uh, did it, between God, vital impulse, and deep self. If we keep, if we keep this equivalence in mind, um, I think. Uh, okay, okay. Can work. Let, uh, <laughs> let me also ask a question to, uh, to Mohit. Uh, Mohit, when you say uh, sympathizing with the other, what is the yeah. framework of the other? I mean, what do you mean by the other? I mean, everything uh, or is it included? I mean, it is uh, also including the self, oneself. Uh, is, what do you, how can you explore this? Uh, uh, sympathy, sympathy to like nature and including everything as well as right. the self identity. Okay, so for uh, both song, uh, sympathizing with the other would mean sympathizing with life, which would have both the human and non-human realms. But for specifically Nishida, there is this kind of a dialectical movement through which uh, if one is able to sympathize with the other, because of this dialectical movement, the, the person is able to know oneself as well. So it kind of connects. So it is by knowing other, it is by, you know, having that kind of a positive element of, uh, you know, loving the next person, so to speak, not in the sense of, you know, having some sort of a knowledge about that person, but just be able to uh, understand the connection, the receptivity which exists between the two, that one can, uh, you know, understand oneself as well. This is very similar to the Buddhist tradition that I want to talk about, but because of the positive of time, I could not, which appears in Chan Buddhism, the Chinese Buddha, so to speak, where the idea of absolute nothingness moves beyond selflessness. So one of the problems which Nishida found in Bergsonian framework is that, yes, I do agree, like this is what Nishida would say to Bergson, that I do agree that there is a durational character to life, that time is far more important in comparison to the spatial constructs which kind of um, distorts our understanding of reality. But at the same time, he says that if you really have to, um, something has to stand outside the flow of duration for us to say that expense, this experience is unrepeatable. Otherwise, there is just no way of doing something like this. For Nishida, duration can only be conceived in terms of a consciousness. And because it is conceived in terms of a consciousness, it cannot lead to absolute negation that consciousness would still remain. And that is one of the problem which emerges uh, as Nishita tries to comprehend Bergson's duration, because Bergson's duration is all about Elan Vital. So the freedom that, you know, per perhaps we were just asking this question, uh, you know, the obedience towards God, in Bergson's case, it would be obedience to this idea of relational process, which forms you. So the obedience or in Bergsonian uh, way of looking at it would be towards this, uh, you know, vitalistic force, this evolutionary basis of understanding religion and not so much towards a uh, Christian God or any kind of a monotheistic way of looking at the world, so to speak. So there the sympathy with the other differs. Uh, in the case of Bergson, it would be with life as such. In Nishida's case, it is with the other person but it is through sympathizing with the other person that one can know oneself as well. Okay, I'm sure there are other interesting questions, uh, comments. Please uh, just 
give the sign or just interrupt. Yeah, I have a question. Yes, Sash. So, yeah, okay, thank you. I thank you for both papers. And perhaps uh, uh, my question is, uh, how to say, relatively something, right? But uh, so I want to ask the question concerning the delay. Mm. Because uh, for Berkson and Nishida, we often talk about uh, the immediate, uh, immediate immediation uh, without mediation. But uh, for Bergson, I think uh, the uh, also important thing is uh, the delay. And for Nishida, I think it's relatively absent uh, this uh, element of uh, delay. And for example, for Alessandra, uh, the action is very important uh, for Bergson and for Nishida. But for Bergson, I think uh, it's also a very important thing is uh, the delay for uh, completion, for uh, perfection, for realization of action. I think uh, the time needs, uh, we need uh, the time to realize uh, this action. And, uh, but for Nishida, how can we uh, consider this uh, delay because we uh, accentuate we underline often the immediate immediation um, and for perhaps uh, for mojito it's the same thing i think for sympathy uh, uh, yes we can talk about the sympathy uh, in bergson and in nishida but for bergson i think uh, mm -hmm. the sympathy uh, needs the time uh, to have the sympathy we have we need the time i think so, uh, uh, and, and then perhaps for me, it's not really important, uh, the distinction between immediation and mediation, because for me, immediation needs a time. So uh, it's not so quite different between uh, immediation and mediation. Um, for me, immediation is uh, the, how to say, uh, trying to remove the mediation. So it's um, not quite different. So it's my question for both. Okay, uh, do you have any response, uh, the speakers? I mean, if you want to say about uh, his comments. Yeah, yeah, I would like to, but Alexandra, if you want to first, then of course. Oh, uh, it's the same. Uh, I can speak later. Okay, <laughs> all right, okay. Okay, so responding to, uh, you know, uh, this question. Uh, yes, absolutely, I feel that uh, in Bergson's case also, this delay matters a lot because it is only through that an impersonal consciousness can be grasped. Uh, it cannot, like this idea of participating in pure experience directly, you know, and that kind of a thing can lead to a very mediated state of affairs, which can distort the way we really look at the world. So Bergson would also like to take a step back, even the you know whole uh, way of uh, making this uh, intuitive model where you know there is a horizontal plane of consciousness which molu ponty did not really uh, capture he was more on the lines of you know the vertical cone that we have also seen in Bergsonian framework he was more on those lines it is only you know through the use that we are able to get a better uh, relook at what Bergson really meant when he was trying to say that intuitive method matters more over the intelligible ways of living in this world. So in that context, I would say, yes, delay matters in uh, the case of Bergson, because it is through a delay that an impersonality, impersonal consciousness can emerge. In the case of Nishida, delay also matters, but in a slightly different context, which is basically that it is through the delay that uh, one can grasp the dialectical movement, which is not so much the case in Bergson, which is more like a vibratory rhythmic quality that he assigns to duration. So both the, both the philosophers are grounded in this idea of intuition, uh, where delay matters, but they are taking this intuitive method in different uh, zones. So their convergence uh, can be spelled out, their convergence can be mapped out only till this point that both of them are speaking about the intuitive metaphysics. But what do they then do with this intuitive metaphysics is something which differs. But both of them, as long as they are talking about intuitive metaphysics, would 
you know, say or would actually emphasize this importance of delaying uh, act, so to speak. So, yeah. Yeah, okay. Alessandra? Um, thank you for this, for this question, uh, because uh, uh, it led me to um, clarif clarify a point. Um, in a way, we can say that uh, when a mystic appears uh, in society, uh, it, uh, il faut <laughs> du temps pour l'assimiler. I mean, uh, in term, uh, a, a time for uh, metabolizing um, <laughs> their message. So uh, the uh, reception uh, from society, uh, the, 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 see, yes, the, the um, society needs time to receive and comprehend and understand the, the message of a mystics and uh, follow his example. So it, it, it is a, a first, um, a first uh, kind of time, I mean. But uh, both Nishida and Bergson uh, do not say that intuition is only a, an, an instantaneous act. I mean, they, they both, both say uh, it is um, not only an effort, but an, ex an everyday exercise. We have to um, uh, engage ourselves every day, and it is uh, another another way to evoke time, uh, um, exercise, uh, exercise, work, and um, another another um, um, reference to delay. But um, I, I would like to say that Yankelevich, in his monography on Bergson, says that uh, delay is the infirmity, the natural infirm in, in infirmity uh, of our intelligence. So in a way, we have to be contemporaneous, but it's quite impossible for us um, to be contemporaneous with the event. But the intuition, I think, is a mixture of contemporaneity and uh, retardement or, or delay, because a mystic, um, uh, the mystical action for Bergson, but also uh, the, the intuitive uh, work, it's a sort of translation of something which is not temporal in the sense of the specialized time in uh, to put uh, to, to, to translate something which is out of time uh, in the sense of out of, of the space time in, uh, in, in the world um, which is especially and temporally oriented. I mean that there is a, a difference because um, Nishida um, uh, is, a, is a philosopher of eternity in a way. Uh, he, has, he has Spinoza behind, the, behind him, uh, but, but I think that duration is a, is a, a vital eternity. We, know, we all know this. So uh, delay I, I, maybe is not the, the, the right term to say this um, implication of, uh, um, uh, yes, the time that the, mess, the, the mystical message takes uh, to, to be understand in a way, uh, but also the time that uh, everyday work uh, to cultivate intuition ask us are, are forms of, um, I don't know <laughs> if I have answer, but. Okay. We, okay. Uh, uh, Katerina, we'll ask a question, but I just realized that our dear friend, uh, Deborah Murato is with us finally in this session. Uh, Deborah, welcome to you. Do you hear me? Okay, maybe. Bojan, Bojan, uh, professor, you said to me something? No, I asked Deborah, Deborah. Maybe she'll show up later. Yeah, okay. So, Katrina, you, uh, it's, 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 it's yours, yeah, your question. Yes, thank you. I have, uh, thank you for this uh, talk, really very, very interesting. I, had, uh, I have some questions for both of you. The first is only for Alessandra, and the second is for both. Mm -hmm. It's the same question for both. And um, to Alessandra, um, I, um, I would like to ask, when you talk about everyday mysticism, which is the different, where is the threshold with intuition, with philosophical intuition? Mm. And, uh, to, uh, and to both of you, 
I would like to ask something about the articulation between me and us, <laughs> because I, I think it's very important what you did and also uh, uh, Hirataga Hiraga this morning did, so showing the importance of the uh, um, mystic experience of uh, intuition and society in the last uh, book of Bergson. And, but if in the early phase of Bergson's philosophy, the personality, the self is very stressed, there's a lot of attention and of, of, of priority even in the personality. Uh, in this last part, uh, insisting so much in the intuition, in the in sympathy, in the waves, in the uh, energy and life in which we, uh, we swim, <laughs> let's say, uh, gives uh, somehow a, an image of, a, of just a social beings or even communitarian beings without faces. <laughs> somehow uh, and where is the how do you compose these two aspects uh, in Bergson's philosophy this is a question that I would like to to share with, with both of you and maybe even the the floor and uh, Mr. Iraga was very interesting this. actually it needs another hour uh, to discuss all of this it is uh, I mean we need to discuss them. okay <laughs> Alessandra I know I know <laughs> thank you Yes, uh, um, I think that the, the everyday mysticism is uh, an everyday um, experience of our freedom. Uh, I, I mean that intuition is, uh, is uh, necessary both for, um, for freedom but for, uh, and for philosophy. So um, uh, it is the method uh, of philosophy, but also the, the act that uh, connect us with um, our deep self uh, and freedom is uh, the expression of this uh, self. So um, probably there, there are uh, affinities uh, between um, philosophical intuition and um, uh, the free act. I mean, and, and Bergson is quite explicit in when he says that uh, philosophy uh, uh, generates joy. And I mean, mm -hmm. there is a, 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 an ethical uh, implication of uh, um, philosophy as activity. Uh, I, um, um, I, I say that um, we have to stress the fact that uh, a free act as a, a mystical act is rare and exceptional. So we, uh, but, but is what uh, Plato says in the seventh uh, letter. I mean, everyday practice and sometimes an intuition, <laughs> everyday okay. practice and uh, sometimes uh, a free act. Um, okay. I think that um, there are difference uh, uh, between um, intuition in philosophy and intuition in uh, in uh, in free action but there is a, a community of, uh, uh, of of intuition uh, i mean uh, between bergson theory of the free act bergson conception of freedom of mysticism and of philosophy um, in a way uh, you know that uh, the the, re the relationship between uh, uh, mysticism and philosophy um, um, knows a, a, a lot of um, uh, uh, Bergson does, uh, does not think uh, always the same thing about the relationship between mysticism and philosophy so we have to uh, exp uh, explore maybe uh, that relation, but the, th uh, the, the, the main point, according to my uh, opinion, is that the free act is, has the same structure of the, the mystic act. Um, so uh, I don't know, because I don't want to, 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 um, to, to, to <laughs> I'm quite tired of it. Uh, uh, okay, uh, it's okay. The, the, I mean, we don't have a lot of time also, so let's, uh, uh, yes. let's also move to to the other uh, speaker, Mohit, if he yeah, has yeah. Not long, please. There are two other questions and we are out of time. Sure, I'll keep it short. So thanks for that question, Katrina. And this question is actually very, very important. Like what is the connection between mysticism and the intuitive method that Bolson tries to talk about? Even with my colleagues in Delhi, when I really tell them that this is what my you know uh, philosophical framework is that I want to see how Bolson and Eliot has these affinities, they always question me, why Bolson? 
Why not Heidegger? Why not, um, you know, Nossi? Why not uh, the Lewis, you know, who are constantly in conversation with each other? The only continental philosopher who would perhaps come close to Bergson would be Levinas. But over there also you have the self and other duality. So I tell them this thing that, you know, it's not just about everyday mysticism. It's not just about talking spirit and moving towards a spiritual glance. That's not what Bergson is doing. The political impl implications of his philosophical framework have just not been properly grasped, not only because he was the ambassador of France and participated in League of Nations, but more so because of the joy of life that he tries to talk about, which kind of, you know, why people have this kind of an idea that you know is uh, more on the mystic lines is because uh, people feel that if you talk about these emotional intensities, it is it's it always has a trap of solipsism. Mm -hmm. The joy of life that I may have in my heart may be absolutely different from someone else, and there lies the real problem. So how do you really? you know, quantify these kind of things. So being a substantive philosophy is very easy to comprehend. But what happens to intensities and becomings and multiplicities? There you lose track. It becomes absolutely difficult. And that's why in some senses, you know, people call it very easily that, you know, Bergson is behaving like a mystic. But I really find it a very uh, dubious position to maintain if one really tries to see what is happening in two sources of morality and religion. And that is, by the way, not the only book in which he tries to talk about freedom and joy. You know, it kind of, um, you know, this kind of a thing uh, occurs as early as in time and free will. So there is a con connectivity, there's a continuity which is there, but it's just like some, I don't know, it's only perhaps because of the news that we were able to go back to Bergson in 1960s, but there is a big lull in his career, which somehow has been interpreted as you know, everyday mysticism, which I really take a case against. I really feel that it is not just about spiritualism or mysticism that Bergson is really trying to talk about. It says something more. It has a philosophical tenet to it. So, yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, I think uh, Amir uh, raised his voice before Alessandro. So, Amir, what is your question or your... Actually, it was Alessandro, I guess. Yeah, but uh, you, you spoke first. Right, and then let's, you go, uh, let's go, I mean. Okay. 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 Okay, okay. I yeah. gave it to you. <laughs> uh, my question is a bit um, uh, perhaps difficult, but at the same time, uh, a, a small question. Uh, in introduction to metaphysics, Bergson, uh, as far as I remember, says that uh, intuition is not a single act, but many. Uh, the act of intuition moves between uh, pure memory and pure perception. So uh, in that uh, little uh, booklet, Bergson also says that you can in intuit uh, the, the eternal, the, the God itself uh, with your, uh, with your this intuitive way. Um, so even if Bergson, uh, uh, in this later uh, books like uh, like Revolution Creatis uh, uh, focuses more on uh, life and lively um, understanding of intuition, let's say. Actually, his philosophy contains, I guess, the, the other ways of mysticism as well. So can we say that um, Nishidium um, an approach of mysticism um, 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 let's say like that can can we say that Bergson's philosophy uh, also con contains some hints um, uh, that we uh, can relate with Nishidium approach of mysticism yeah can we say that Okay, so uh, Amir is a potential Bergsonian student. Uh, he is doing his MA uh, uh, now as, at our university, uh, he's my student. So, and he is very uh, energetic actually to read and to discuss. So uh, it will be a good beginning for him, this, this event. <laughs> uh, he was excited to join. Uh, so Alessandra, can you uh, give an answer to his question? Yes. 
sorry by the way you both can answer oh okay <laughs> Okay, but I, I just want to be sure to 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 understand you. You you ask uh, you ask if uh, Bergsonism is uh, close to uh, Nishida's mysticism. Uh, not not just close, but also um, his philosophy contains some Nishidian approaches as well. Even if he he did not focus on that, uh, uh, let's say areas too much. Oh. Yes, I, 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 uh, I tried to, to show there is an affinity between energies, so not Mishi, uh, Nishida's mysticism, because uh, um, uh, Nishida does not deal directly with mysticism. Um, in, in, in as far as, as, as I can um, know about Nishida philosophy, um, uh, there is no uh, a, a, an explicit um, uh, uh, conception or of mysticism uh, of Nishida, but there is a, a, a community of intuition uh, between energetism as a, a religious ethic and uh, Bergson theory of freedom a, a, and a lot of affinities uh, among um, between their common use of intuition uh, and the other uh, themes that um, are um, uh, uh, nous avons uh, traité uh, les derniers jours dans, <laughs> dans la conférence. Uh, oui, je, je, je pense. Um, Est-ce que je peux parler en français? Oui, oui. Uh, okay. uh, oui, parce que il a plu. <laughs> mais mais je, je ne sais pas, je ne connais pas uh, vraiment complètement la, la philosophie de Nishida. J'ai lu tous les tous les livres qui ont été traduits en italien, mais je ne connais pas une théorie euh, nichidienne mystique euh, proprement, euh, proprement en dire, mais et c est, c est, je ne sais pas si j'ai compris euh, ta question euh, de la meilleure façon. Peut-être que je n'ai pas compris les... les, 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 les. Mais je voudrais dire une petite un petit chose euh, à, à Katerina, parce que si, si je peux, parce que euh, évidemment, euh, l'idée de société qui ont euh, euh, Nishida Bergson, c'est une société qui c'est une sorte d'harmonie, de différence. So, uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, if, if we develop our self, our individual self, so uh, differentiate uh, at a maximum degree, we, we are those. Uh, we are those difference uh, who made the heterogeneity of uh, uh, continuity. I mean. Uh, the, I'm sorry, but I want to. Uh, to you can you can switch anytime from French into English. Okay, to, yes. Into, uh, English. It's my That's first right. time in a double language. Grazie, so. Alessandro. Mm. So. Okay, uh, Mohit, do you want to, to say something? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, thanks for that question, Emir. Uh, I would like to, as uh, Alexandra has suggested, I would also like to state this thing that there is no direct reference to mysticism in Nishida's works, but because he draws a lot from the Mahayana tradition, uh, which also has a lot of links with Nagarjuna and another Indian philosopher of Shunita, nothingness, there is a middle ground that perhaps emerges in Nishida's, if you have to use the word mysticism, which is between the I and you. And what he's trying to do is this kind of a duality, which is there uh, in Nishida, as is the case in Mahayana tradition, dissolves into absolute nothingness. But this is not something which is happening in Bergson. There is no dissolution. The duration remains. It endures. This whole focus is on endurance. And because there is this intuition which endures, this impersonal intuition which endures, this duality which, with which we begin our understanding of life, which is I and you, you know, the first uh, conversation which has to happen between the two people, when this endures further, it becomes pluralistic. So then it connects to what Katrina was also asking about the question of us. So in Bergson, uh, the question of us remains very much alive, but that is not so much the case in Nishida because there's a dissolution 
uh, of the category of I and category of you. So their mysticisms, if you have to use that word again, would differ in this context that uh, in the case of Nishida, it can very easily be qualified as something informed by a Buddhist tradition. There is a very strongly religious impetus behind it. But in the case of Bergson, it would not be the case. Because if we qualify Bergson's two sources of morality and religion also as uh, you know talking about a monotheistic religion, then of course it is going to lead to a closed society, which Bergson was very clear about not having in this world. Okay, But he was also clear about this thing that there is no uh, absolutely closed society and absolutely open society. These kind of things keep on intermingling with each other. Okay, so that's the kind of duality that we get to see. But what is the thing which endures further out of this open society and the closed society? It is our intuition, which after a point of time, because of factoring in the delay part, it becomes impersonal. Uh, the question that Hizashi had asked just before. Okay. So that's what I would like to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alessandro, actually, in the beginning of your, uh, of your paper, you were talking about a possibility of a community of intuition between uh, Verson and Nishida, a sort of tele telepathy. That was interesting. So maybe Amir's question uh, to, to have some sort of common approach could be under that. Uh, yes, yes. Then I removed the, the passage <laughs> with the <laughs> reference to <laughs> telepathy, just to be sure. Uh, <laughs> To be on time, but uh, yes, it, it it could be an image. I mean, but, but also a fact. Okay. There is a, a sort of... Okay. Now, uh, Alessandro to Alessandra, uh, <laughs> your question. Also for uh, your excellent presentation, and uh, I have a question to Alessandra uh, um, about uh, two references. Uh, you made in your um, your presentation. One is a uh, reference to page 43 of the uh, two sources, and it is about uh, the fusion and the uh, and the uh, solidification of the material of intelligence, uh, which reminds me the first le lecture of the uh, revolution of the Liberté, uh, in which uh, Berson uh, uh, uses the metaphor of the uh, forces of the uh, eruption forces and sedimentation forces uh, to describe uh, the alternance uh, between uh, freedom and uh, necessity in, uh, in, uh, in the history of philosophy. The second one uh, references, it's uh, right after, if I rightly remember, is to Kuhn uh, structural scientific revolutions. Uh, so, uh, so Seeing that, uh, and uh, assuming uh, the non-confirmed hypothesis uh, that uh, there are some, there are revol philosophical revolution, uh, does uh, um, Bersonian mysticism could provide uh, a good theorization to describe a philosophical revolution, and uh, does uh, uh, mysticism into Bersonian philosophy could be by analogy? Uh, a good um, a good way to describe uh, his own his own conception of discontinuity in uh, the history of philosophy. Mm. Okay. Um, uh, thank you for for the for the question. Um, uh, yes. Um, um the 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 the, the associate association with uh, thomas kuhn uh, theory uh, i think is is quite useful because in effect um the, the the opposition is between something which is crystallized and static and uh, which is not more uh, able to produce effect drag uh, and so on so uh what when so, something new arrives, uh, clashes with our uh, previous vision or conception, and uh, there is a time to assimilate and revise re re um, um, uh, uh, our... Um, so but you ask me if... Uh, um, because, yes, in the Dalle Cours sur les problèmes 
de la liberté, il y a euh, aussi des images euh, euh, similaires euh, parce que bah, euh, Bergson pense toujours qu'il y a une force, une force. c'est vraiment Nietzsche de, de, par rapport à ça parce qu'il y a une force et une forme. Euh, c'est une énergie qui coule comme, comme, comme lava euh, dans, dans des, des, des formes, et, mais quand les formes sont euh, euh, tr très peu vivantes, euh, très peu... Euh, euh, je suis... <rire> euh, je suis un loco la lingua. Mais je... <rire> euh, euh, la dernière question, je n'ai pas compris euh, qu ce que tu veux savoir. Euh, la dernière question sur la... Euh, si, ah, oui, euh, euh, le, le point, c'est que Bergson s'est euh, bewitched, euh, s'est fasciné, euh, stregato, par le pouvoir de Mystics pour transformer et exprimer l'énergie, la vitale énergie dans leurs actions. So, I think that Uh, and it is quite explicit. Philosophy should take into account to convalidate mystical experience and imitate mystical experience. Uh, and I think that if we believe that uh, in, in this equivalence between God, vital impulse, a uh, deep self, uh, the, uh, the, the community of intuition and the community among philosophy, uh, art, uh, moral action and religious uh, um, practice or experience is quite uh, evident. Uh, I mean, that Bergson, um, um, I, I, I don't know how, uh, how uh, like in English, uh, I, I was looking for this term, but uh, it's very important, the, the, this kind of approach to mysticism, uh, just to um, propose a model for action, uh, but also uh, uh, philosophical action. So I don't know, I don't know if Bergson uh, believe in revolution. Uh, I think it's um, maybe more re reformist, but um, uh, reform uh, is a long process uh, who needs time, who takes time, uh, which is um, created by a, a, an act which breaks all the, all the, cut, uh, all the frames. Uh, so, Mystics is, um, is um, I don't know. Uh, okay, okay. <laughs> and finally, just final uh, point. Uh, Morten has an objection to the absence of mysticism in Nishida. Please, can you give one or two, I mean, very shortly, what, what, what you uh, want to emphasize? Yes? J'ai une question uh, très courte. D'accord, d'accord, d'accord. Uh, avant, uh, Morten. C'est que dans la propagation du mysticisme, je crois qu'il ne s'agit plus de l'intuition, mais l'émotion. Et l'émotion, l'émotion, c'est plus profond que l'intuition et c'est directement de loin sali avec l'émotion fondamentale divine que les mystiques ont reçu de Dieu. Et donc, ce qui m'a... Euh, ce, qui, ce qui est resté un peu, comment dire, étrange, c'est que l'intuition philosophique non, ne non, peut non, pas... Non. À, à, No, Identifié avec l'émotion dans la propagation oh. du mysticisme. C'est très important, je crois. Oui, oui, d'accord. Euh, Morten? Ah, yes. Uh... Sorry. Um, you, you caught me off guard for a moment there. Yes, I uh, I was um, um, I was I was uh, objecting to the fact that, that, that it, it was being said that there were no um, no references to uh, to mysticism in in, in Nishida's Nishida. works, hmm. uh, which is it's it's not true. Uh, there there it's he often uh, re refers to to mysticism and also uses the the adjective. 
mystic, shinpi uh, teki, shinpi shugi is uh, mysticism. In any case, um, also refers to uh, um, mystic thinkers like Eckhart and so on and so forth. And there is a whole uh, tradition in the Kyoto school of, uh, um, of, of, of reading Eckhart closely, for example. Um, so, uh, and there was another uh, thing that I, that I, I wanted to point out. Um, it, the, it, should, it should be taken into account that the, the translation of intuition and reflection and self-consciousness is quite incomplete. It's, it's not um, very clearly pointed out by the translators, but they've, they've made uh, very serious cuts in the translation without indicating it. Uh, so um, I don't know if there are, if, if there are uh, mentions uh, in the original that fall into the, to the gaps in the, uh, in the English translation, uh, but it's, it's important to keep that in mind. I, I think, uh, Morten, this is because uh, most, some of uh, the speakers, they rely on tra the translation of... of, of ah, the sure. That's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah. The, the main reason. So I suggest to improve uh, Japanese, I mean, uh, in, in our Bexonian studies as a kind of the language source next to French and, and, uh, and, and English. Uh, perhaps that could be the third language. I really, I really welcome it. I, I think it's wonderful that people are, are, trans, are, are working on, on Nishida as well. Uh, uh, Bergsonians uh, uh, okay. working on, on Nishida. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's great. I just wanted to say, yeah, uh, yeah that uh, since, since it was being said that in, in, uh, in the second book, uh, there were no uh, references to it. I don't know if, if there are, but in any case, uh, one needs to take a bit care about saying that he doesn't mention it in that, that one. At least you can say that. In, in the, the translation, because the really, really need more studies, examinations, more close uh, kind of mm. uh, comparisons of text, textual analysis. Uh, but before uh, giving the floor to, because we are out of time now, we before giving the floor to Yasushi for uh, concluding remarks, I want to uh, I want to give a couple of my general impressions on this conference. First of all, I think that I mean now Fukuoka. Uh, is uh, a candidate to be a second school of Bergsonism uh, with the help of Korean uh, scholars. I didn't know that Korea was closer to uh, Fukuoka than Tokyo. So uh, uh, there is a possibility of joining together and establishing a 21st century school of uh, Bergsonism. Uh, like in, 20, uh, in 1920s, 30s, there was Bergsonian school in Kyoto and now maybe in Fukuoka. I don't know how Isashi's uh, university is close to Fukuoka or not, but they can join. Yeah, very if close, possible. Yeah. Uh, my second impression uh, is uh, that, uh, I mean, I'm so delighted that international scholars, they are, I mean, interested in other like East Asian uh, thoughts, Bergsonism. Uh, so it is very uh, much uh, helpful that we will have a more international, more global studies uh, on, on Bergsonism with the contributions of other regions to, this, to specific regions. Uh, young scholars, now they are interested in Nishida, in uh, Tadame and others. Uh, that is quite inspiring. Uh, and uh, thirdly, I would like uh, on, the, uh, on, behalf of, on behalf of all moderators, speakers, participants, I would like to thank to Fukuoka University for this uh, hospitality, like smiling hospitality, because it is from far, but still we feel that we are in Fukuoka. Uh, so thank you, Yasushi. I would like I would like uh, to uh, op you to open the, your microphones and uh, give an an, an, an loud uh, applaud, like Ellie was emphasizing. Uh, emphasizing uh, like uh, a kind of a silent applaud, but now we can give a, a, a loud applaud, a loud clap to uh, Yasushi and all his team at Fukuoka. And I also want to give my deep 
gratitude to Katarina for her uh, from the beginning, from the first day of this project up to now, uh, being so supportive, so kind of uh, inspiring to all of us uh, for uh, to, to to for the continuation and for the uh, success of this project. And she is always here, always with us. And uh, uh, anytime we need, uh, we, we we can reach her. So this project is possible with uh, because of uh, Katerina and her uh, really uh, very uh, supportive uh, assistance and, and support. So uh, I would like also to thank her uh, with a loud applaud to Katerina. Thank you, uh, it is really your project, our project. Thank you. I know, uh, it Thanks is, so much, I also you. want to also appreciate Baxon to be still alive in the early 21st century in Japan and this is uh, probably because of his the strength of his philosophy, the strength of his global uh, uh, mind, and this is um, probably uh, need to be uh, mentioned.